Our next speaker is Olof Mogren. He's heading the AI research group at RISE in Gothenburg. His research interests include representation learning, uh, data privacy, and modeling the world around us in applications such as analytics of medical texts, image processing, and sensor modeling. He will talk about fairness and bias in language models. Um, so while we're waiting for, for uh, Olof to, uh, to connect, um, I can just remind you that uh, ask your questions on Slack, and those of you that asked questions uh, that we didn't have time to answer right now, we will send them to Ture afterwards, and uh, hopefully he will have time to answer some of them, uh, either in Slack or in some other medium. Um, and we will be uh, publishing those answers as, as we get them. Okay, thank you. All right. So, hello, crowd in virtual space. My name is Olaf Mogre. Thank you for the introduction, Josef. I am now the second white male middle-aged AI researcher talking about fairness and bias today. And I'm happy about that because white male researchers should also consider bias and fairness in our models. So also thank you, Tula, for this uh, thorough uh, introduction of, of the foundations of this, of this field. I hope to be able to connect a little bit to that, but also to get a bit more into the nitty gritty, a bit closer to the data and to some of the practices. Um, I am head of uh, deep learning research at RISE, and the title of my talk is Social Bias and Fairness in Natural Language Processing. Okay, natural language processing is a field of research. It's the field of research that considers um, language data. And this is a kind of protocol for interhuman communication. And it's discrete, which, which can, be, uh, can be something that you need to consider a bit. Um, in contrast to some other uh, data types, which we, we are more used to uh, working with, with uh, neural networks and deep learning. So some tasks from this field are classification, translation, summarization, generation, understanding, dialogue modeling, etc. These are many and they are diverse. So are the solutions. There are many and they are diverse. Um, yet I will lump them all together uh, today and just refer to them as, as NLP um, solutions. Um, now, you all know that in the last 10 or 20 years, uh, we've had some, some transformations in the field. Uh, one of the important uh, such moments uh, was uh, the advent of uh, learned word embeddings. So these are representations for language, which superseded sort of count-based representations for language. An example is, is uh, from Mikolov AL in 2013, uh, the word to back model or the skip gram uh, and the continuous back of words models, um, where we get a vector assigned to each, each word. So for example, for a queen here in the middle, uh, in the vector space, uh, you have the closest neighbors are queens, princess, king, monarch. Uh, and it seems like these vectors are capturing some properties from, from the semantics of the language. Similarly, closest neighbors to Stockholm is Stockholm, Sweden, Helsinki, Oslo, Oslo, Norway. So we, we seem to find capitals of the Nordic region um, close in this space. Now this, this uh, follows the, the distributional hypothesis, which was stated uh, by Harris in 1954, words that has similar meaning occur in similar context, and this is also uh, follows um, how we train these, these, because we train these using large corpora of text uh, and the co-occurrence of words. Okay, so word embeddings was a great way of doing transfer learning for language. We could train these vector models on large corpora of text and we could leverage that knowledge from that large training corpus towards tasks where we didn't have so, so large data. 
Um, so an example of these NLP solutions are depicted in this in this picture. We have the data flowing in from the bottom and the first uh, box in this NLP pipeline, which was sort of how you how you did stuff before and possibly also do it now. Um, uh, so the representation box here is where we assign these vectors. And these are learned from the auxiliary data. And then you have some more boxes where you where you add some more processing and finally the prediction. So some examples of, of, of tasks where this has been successful is summarization, translation, text classification, and so on. Um, OK. I also uh, think that most of you are aware of, of another moment in the NLP uh, field uh, in recent years. Uh, you all have, have heard of models such as BERT or GPT-123, among a lot of other names um, for uh, instances of transformer-based models. Uh, these are models that, that use the attention mechanism uh, to, uh, to find out the dependencies in the text. Now, the only important thing of, of this uh, picture is sort of the arrows going from the left to the right. There are more important things, but, but the attention mechanism is what's depicted with a with a arrows to the left to the right and also some loop circles there. Now these are also trained uh, using large corpora of un unnotated text uh, for language modeling. That is predicting some words that are in a certain context. And uh, uh, these are also often used as drop-in replacements in these NLP pipelines. Uh, but then they are considered to be word embeddings that change to um, change with regards to the context of the word, not only by, by the word. So this was called the NLP's ImageNet moment. Uh, we can now do deep transfer learning for language, which we have done in uh, <clears throat> in image processing from about 2014, uh, perhaps. Um, and and this is of course as. You most of you know, uh, allowed for, for this, uh, this boom of, of high accuracy models for many different tasks within natural language processing. And perhaps also more, more complex tasks, such, such as question answering, reading comprehension, natural language inference and tra translation, constituency parsing, et cetera. Right. So in uh, uh, 2016 at NeurIPS, uh, Bolik et al. Uh, presented the paper, man is to computer programmer as woman is to homemaker. And they shed some light on some of the, the bias that is in the word to vec model as, as presented and pre-trained by, by Mikhailov et al. And they show that, for example, um, occupation names have strong uh, connection to, to the gender. So. Uh, finding these dimensions in the in the vector space uh, that uh, that variates with with gender, uh, and then optimizing and going to extreme she, uh, then you find occupations such as homemaker, nurse, receptionist, librarian, and so on. And for for the opposite for male, uh, you find maestro, skipper, prodigy, philosopher, and so on. Uh, similarly. Uh, they produce these analogies of gender stereotypes, such as housewife, shopkeeper, or, or registered nurse, physician, and so on. Okay, so these are some, some images from Kai Wei Chen, um, showing some of the issues with other natural languages, uh, natural language processing um, algorithms, uh, which are sort of complete solutions uh, that at the time uh, we're producing great, great on these different talks. So top left, we see textual entailment, and we see that when uh, giving a sentence with the word runner, um, the the model correctly produces the the entailment decision. Uh, but when replacing this runner with the synonym razor, uh, we get a contradiction instead. So in this sense, many of these models are brittle, and this may have some <clears throat> some effects. Um, that we'll, we'll get to here. Um, 
he also shows that that there is gender bias not only in the in the vector space but also in in algorithms such as for coreference resolution. I'm not sure if you can see the the small print here to in the picture to the right, uh, but there is a sentence about the president, and then the second president second sentence start with with the pronoun uh, his, uh, and this refers to this refers to the president. And when the sentence starts with his, uh, the coreference resolution engine correctly assigns this to the president. But when you replace his with her, uh, the high performing model at the time failed to connect this to the, uh, to the president. Um, you can see similar stuff in language generation models uh, as pictured, pictured in the left, uh, left bottom here. Okay. Um, Salgan and Olson, uh, my colleagues at RISE, uh, <coughs> published a paper and demonstrated that this also happens in, in modern uh, models such as BERT, ELMO, uh, FASTX, Vertivax, and also in, in Swedish. They also studied gender and occupation. Saliskan et al. in 2017 uh, showed correlation between occupations and how they actually are in in real world how many people how many male and female work in certain occupations and they showed correlation in the uh, embeddings uh, they they correlate with this this sort of the the, the real world um, the real world bias now don't we want the model to be true to the data? Uh, if the model captures what's really there in, in the world, not only in the language, but also in the world, um, perhaps we really want to model this. But we need to be a bit careful about what we really want to model. Um, and this, uh, of course, is, is something that Tore talked a lot about. Um, it depends on, on what, what are we doing and what is bias here. So, uh, for example, Amazon uh, tried out an algorithm for resume filtering, which was trained on resumes submitted uh, to, uh, I think, programmer positions at Amazon. And of course, in this data, uh, there are a lot of men. And so the algorithm decided that, well, it's, it's good to be a man because then we should hire, hire them. So, so um, going just straight from the data may not be the right thing in that situation. We have laws and we have, um, this is a particular case where, where the laws are, are really clear. We cannot favor uh, a man before a more competent woman. Um, similar stuff we have in insurance, uh, lending, hiring, of course. Um, uh, also next word prediction on your phone is something that where Google has been working a lot, of the, a lot on this. Uh, and in the coreference resolution example before with the precedent, uh, the algorithm may actually work worse, uh, or perform worse uh, if it's more biased. Um, so a question here may be, uh, are we sort of keeping the status quo? Are we, are we supposed to mirror how the world works or are we instead training a model to do what we needed to do, or what we wanted to do, or what is legal to do. Right, so we have these concerns. We have the concern of social bias, and we see that it, it happens. We have gender bias, racial bias, and so on. And on what attributes can we base a decision? This was previously uh, perhaps easier when we have smaller data. Um, but now it's not that easy because we, we want the models that, that take large data um, because it gives us so much more. But then how can we isolate uh, the things that we are interested in and the things that are sensitive? Um, so we have fairness and we have also privacy, which is closely connected to this. Um, and on the technical side here in the blue, we have disentanglement. And this all sort of comes down to uh, the covariation or the correlation. Um, 
of, of course, we're training models that are trained on on correlation, but but not the causation, which is much more difficult to to find in a data driven model. Uh, yet this is sort of where we need to go. We need to go towards the causation. Um, also, we need to to generalize in the good sense that we uh, studying machine learning are used to. Okay, so some of the approaches towards this are doing data augmentation, training models with where you perhaps switch words, switch her and his, and retrain models with that data. You can calibrate models that are already trained to be less biased. And you can use adversar adversarial representation learning uh, to train a model to be better at, at sort of uh, convincing the, the adversary that, that you're not biased. Data augmentation, as I mentioned, uh, so for example, replacing pronouns, but also making anonymization of, of names. An example is the Winnow Bias dataset, and uh, uh, for more details, go to Xiao Wei. Um, calibration instead, uh, this was actually uh, demonstrated in the Volok Basi paper mentioned before, NURBS 2016. So they identified the dimensions um, only linear in the space, in the vector space. Uh, the dimension that, that correlates most with, with the gender. And uh, uh, then they sort of uh, zeroed out this, this dimension. Uh, and they succeeded to, to some extent to, uh, 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 to de-bias the model in this way. Um, Similar from uh, Chao et al. Uh, they also did this uh, did this in a two-step process. Um, as I mentioned, we may need to go into the causal direction. And uh, Kusner et al. Uh, Neurops 2017, I think, uh, went in this direction and trained a model to make the same decision in this world as in the counterfactual world. In the counterfactual world, uh, that is when you're, you're, you, you, you're belonging to the other group. So whether you're a man or a woman, whether you're white skin or, or dark skin. Okay, uh, I mentioned also that this is, uh, this is connected, connected to privacy. Because at the, at the core, uh, working with machine learning, we need to disentangle stuff. We need to disentangle the sensitive stuff from the non-sensitive stuff. Uh, so this is a paper that, uh, that we have worked on for this, uh, and we have uh, trained an adversarial setup uh, to make this, this distinction. So in these experiments, we have defined it as, as um, selective privacy, where we have one sensitive attribute. Um, you can certainly just tweak it towards, uh, towards a bias setting instead. Uh, in this picture, uh, we have the sensitive attribute, which is, which is the smile, and we have found that not only making the, the adversary uncertain, which sort of generally blurs out the data, um, it's also good to add more, add new random data. So we add a random smile, you can say, and we have generated that uh, does this. So we've done this on images and, and sound, and now, uh, language may be the next step of that. Uh, adversarial training for devising of language uh, has been uh, done. For example, Zhang uh, did this with uh, um, did this and Friedrich et al. Also, uh, here you 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 in Friedrich they also had the privacy uh, privacy perspective and they have the adversary to detect the privacy leakage in embeddings. And then train the embeddings to fool the adversary, uh, to fool the adversary about the sensitive information that is. And um, this, of course, requires uh, some some augmentation in the data to train it. Okay, thank you for this. Um, this thank you. Um, are some of my collaborators huh. on these topics. And uh, perhaps we have some seconds for some questions. Yeah, I mean, uh, the next speaker will be Carl at 10.35. And we will take five or ten minutes of questions and then a short break. So, 
we have a couple of questions that have come in through the chat. Um, they are partly answered by by your your um, your talk, uh, but so so in in. In language models, you mentioned that you different techniques of actually changing the data set uh, and modifying the pronouns he or she or something like that. So, but it seems to me that it's difficult beforehand to actually find all the words that might be problematic. I mean, we have some idea, he or she, for example. Uh, but have you thought about the strategy actually to be able to uh, extend that set of words to be able to cover all the different kind of biases that you might have, or do you see that as a case-by-case -case question? I haven't seen any any literature doing this in, in a sort of um, convincing manner. Uh, so I think it's 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 considered to be a, a manual uh, data tagging work uh, where there's, or of course, there's a lot of arbitrariness, and and uh, what is it that you're selecting, and so on. And can you automate some of it, some part of it? Um, have, those are yeah. uh, have, open questions. Have you, have you seen examples of how people do that? They change the, the problematic words and actually see if that's consistent or not consistent as the language model approaches new questions. Uh, uh, how do you mean consistent? I mean, I mean, it seems like if you if you change some of the words in the language model, but not do it consistently depending on all the different other words that might be connected, for example. He or she mm -hmm. might be connected to grandma or grandpa. Or, uh... I think this comes down to, to what, is, what is the bias and what is the bias that, that we want to be uh, not reacting to. Um, you would want the, the model to sort of have, have some randomness in this, some stochasticity. You would want to train it both with language, both with sentences talking about uh, the president he or the president she. Um, but but these are just uh, these are just heuristics. So okay, I, I mean in the in the Salgren and Olson paper, uh, they mentioned differences between bias in word representations and more these larger models like like BERT, for example. And they see differences in how biased these different uh, approaches to language modeling are. So uh, since the Sargen and Olson paper, paper, we have also seen these larger models that are even, even bigger like than BERT when it came out. Do you think that these larger models will be less or more biased in terms of they can see more of the language? They can see more of the language. They can be trained on larger data sets. Uh, but what what what's in that data? That, that's just the big question here. Mm -hmm. And I mean, GPT three is this is a monster of, of of parameters, and and it's just it's just a matter of of going through more data. But that's that's not data that will be unbiased in any way. Okay, so, so the, the jury is still out there on this one, I guess. Or uh, uh, no, I'd say I'd say that the, we haven't solved it, mm. right? No, no. The jury is still out there in the sense that we we need to work on it. Okay, so we have a question for Jesper here. Uh, could you expand a bit on the relationship between bias and causality, uh, specifically global bias versus local bias, if you? Sure. Um, so, so, so the problem in the in, when starting to to seeing this as a as a causal thing is that we we really want to to find the the causal relations in the data, and that is super hard to do. Uh, in uh, I can really recommend the, the, this Kuzner paper. Uh, where you sort of you you assume that the scores on your SATs they do depend on whether you're a man or you're a woman, uh, and then you have the flow of of the the gender going through the whole uh, the whole thing. Um, I think what it boils down to when working with real data is is that we need to do the the we need to do the disentanglement, and yet. Uh, we cannot, and this is this is, you cannot disentangle everything because because you will you will mess up the data. We have correlations in the data, and we need correlations to be able to learn something. And then it's then it's just a question of of finding the right 
the right uh, trade-offs here. And that's also what Tore talked about earlier. Um, you have these six, uh, you generally cannot choose all of them, but you need to choose what, what are the important stuff here um, and, and then sort of optimize for that. Great. Uh, in the adversarial setup, you can you can sort of set this whole optimization problem up this way, and th and that's a nice thing, I think. Okay, thank you for uh, for those answers and for a very nice talk and uh, your input on this important issue. I think, especially now since these language models are becoming so used out there. Uh, now we have uh, ten minutes of break, uh, and we will get back after those ten minutes with the call who will talk about the uh, common pitfalls in statistics or how we use data in, in, uh, in, in our professional word, work. Okay, thank you and see you in 10 minutes.